thank you again for coming to the Ox Conference, showing your support. I want to say thank you to all those here that have helped with the food and the music. We can give a hand for the Belfair Church. you to feel sorry for me. I'm not trying to get you to, to think I'm anything special. Because I'm not the only one that's gone through things. Everybody has. But this is the testimony that God's given me. And I don't want to ever forget about it. So I'll talk about it. I'll sing about it. I'll preach about it. I'll shout about it. I'll dance about it. Growing up so many times, I remember getting on my knees in the prayer room, and I would sit there and say, God, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, God, I want to be anointed, do whatever it takes, God, I want to be called, do whatever it takes, God, I want to be a prayer warrior, do whatever it takes. God, I want to be a soul winner. Do whatever it takes. And you know what the hard part is? God listens to those prayers. And you know, I sat there in the hospital so many times. And I'm sure you guys did with your, with your baby. And you're saying, God, I know you can. I know you can heal her. Why aren't you? I know, God, you could sweep in and do the miraculous. It would be great. There's so many people paying attention to my daughter's story. God, it would be such a testimony if you would just sweep in and you would just heal her. God, why won't you heal her? And I believe God spoke to me and said, it's because I'm doing whatever it takes. I'm doing whatever it takes. I know we sit there sometimes and we say, God, why aren't you hearing my prayers? Why aren't you answering my prayers? And God's saying, I'm not answering your now prayers, but I'm answering your past prayers. When you prayed to me and said, do whatever it takes. When you said, God, I want revival, do whatever it takes. God's saying, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing whatever it takes. When you said you wanted your children to be saved and you said, God, do whatever it takes. God said, I'm doing what it takes. You put the responsibility in my hand to do whatever I can do and that is what I'm doing. I'm reaching into the, to what you didn't think would be possible, what you didn't think I would 
would have to do in order to change the situation. I'm doing whatever it takes. You said whatever it takes, save my spouse. Whatever it takes, save this church. Whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes. And then we sit there and complain when God starts to do whatever it takes. We've got to be able to trust God enough to say, God, it's not fun. God, I don't understand why I'm going through this. Uh, but God, just keep doing whatever it takes. Let me be a vessel somehow. God, use me. Whatever it takes. Even though now I've tasted of the price. I've tasted the cost. But just keep doing whatever it takes. Can we just lift up our hands for just a few oh. moments and say, God, just continue doing whatever it takes. Yes. God, whatever you got to do, I'm putting it in your hands. God, I may be suffering. I may be going through torment. God, it's not fun. I don't want to give up sometimes. But God, just keep doing whatever it takes. Oh. Don't ever stop doing whatever it takes. God, I want to see my baby.
Yes. You have been so, so kind to us. Yes. Thank you yes. for making the sacrifice to come Amen. to this conference. Our lives are blessed and enriched because yes. of your lives. Yes, and I appreciate the illustration that Brother Shamaris gave to us about the birds. Yes. Yeah. How those birds flocking together, that's a unique thing. They're observing one another. Amen? Right. They are paying attention to one another. Amen? That's good. Yeah. They are supporting one another, protecting one another. So today, with the help of God, I want to preach to us what I definitely feel that the Lord has put on my heart for some time. We're going to look at one verse to open with. It's in 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, verse number 21. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse number 21. Are you thankful for the word of the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. And here we have the Apostle Paul. He is speaking to Timothy. And he is giving instruction to this younger minister. And I don't want to, you know, take for granted the fact that we have young people in this service today. That it's very possible that God would, in fact, be utilizing your lives in the ministry as well as those of us that are in an older age category. Amen? Amen. Amen. Think about the fact that God begins to deal with people in their youth or even in their childhood. Right. I know that God began to speak to me when I was probably 12 or 14, yeah. and I ran from it. I was scared of it. I didn't know what it meant. But thank God he didn't stop talking Amen. to me. Thank you. Come on. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 21, this is what the Apostle Paul said, If a man therefore purge himself from these things or from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Lord Jesus, we pray today, anoint us to hear your word, your voice, God, within our inner man, within our soul, in the deepest part of our inner being, God, we desire, we desire, Lord, your move in us, your will accomplished in us, your power, God, transforming us into vessels for your glory in Jesus name God bless you you may be seated I want to start today by speaking about a fellow ox that I believe many of you will know his name was Ari Prado many of you will know him better than me some of you may not know him at all. His life was transformed by Jesus Christ when he was 18 years old, according to the obituary that I read online. 
Shortly after that point, he felt called of God into the ministry. And as time progressed, he came to the point in the year 2015 when he and his family started East Bay Bible Fellowship Church in Alameda, California. And he pastored that church until October 29th, 2023, when he passed at the age of 45 from this life into his eternal reward with God. During his ministry, he preached in English and he preached in Spanish to tens of thousands of people across the United States of America and around the world. He authored Christian teaching materials for Christian development and for Bible studies. He not only ministered to the lost and to the body of Christ, but he also ministered to the ministry. I only met him in person once, and that was at the conference that he preached in McMinnville, Oregon in September of last year, 2023. It's possible that that was maybe the last conference that he preached before he fell ill. However, my family and I have listened to many anointed messages that he had preached in many different places prior to meeting him in person last September. I would say you come to know an ox even from afar. And we're utilizing the Bible verse that speaks about Muzzle not the ox when he treadeth out the corn as an illustration of the ministry. The ox being representative of the ministry. Right. You can come to know an ox from afar when you hear and when you see him working and preaching and teaching and laboring and pulling and pouring himself into the work that is set before him by God. The same thing is true of many oxes that you and I have seen and heard minister from afar even over the years in the kingdom of God. I'm bringing up this today because when he passed away, Brother Jerry Miranda, who pastors in Salem, Oregon, posted a message about the passing of his friend, Brother Ari Prado. And I replied to Brother Miranda's post about the passing of Brother Prado. And that post that I made that day is the inspiration that I received for the message I am about to preach to you today. I will honestly tell you that my reply to that post flowed out of my spirit that day as naturally as my breath flows in and out of my lungs right now. My reply to Brother Miranda's post was this regarding Brother Prado. The highest privilege, hear me carefully, church, the highest privilege, the greatest honor, and the most sacred purpose among mankind is to be called to be a vessel of ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you can hear that and believe that and receive that. I'm not trying to be insensitive or callous about the passing of our dear brother Prado, but simply put, his life and your life and 
and my life can be summarized by grasping and embracing the truth that the highest privilege, the greatest honor, the most sacred purpose among mankind is to be called to be a vessel of ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Come on. Ah, may the mighty rushing wind of God come and surround us right now. May the cloven tongues of God settle on us right now. May the anointing of God break every yoke that is not of God off of our lives right now. Because Brother Prado was an example of an ox that became a vessel that was used in the master's hands. Can I tell you who you are? You are a vessel. You are a vessel that is designed to be a vessel of honor. A vessel that is sanctified. A vessel that is meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Yes. They just sent me a text. There's an app issue at the building where she's at right now. I know, Jesus. Right now, Lord, we bind the spirit of murder. We bind the spirit of violence. We bind the spirit of terrorism. We bind this active shooter and the spirit that motivates him. In the name of Jesus Christ, my husband. Now, this man is open. and to the power of the Spirit of God. And the law enforcement now comes and apprehends this man. And all of the innocent lives are saved. Innocent lives are protected. The shelter of God is upon the innocent lives of these people in the name that's above every other name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God. We praise you, God. We thank you, God. We honor you, God. Hallelujah. Victory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. That's fine, brother. Not a problem. Hallelujah. Can I tell you that the calling of God requires separation? Yes. And separation is at the heart of holiness unto the Lord. First, the calling of God identifies you. And that identifying then separates you. And then that separating directs you to the house of the one who makes vessels. To the house of the refiner. Yes. To the house of the one that is the worker in gold. And the worker in silver. And the worker in brass. And the worker in stone. And the worker in wood. And the worker in clay. And I'm not talking about an idol maker. I'm talking about God. Yes. God being the one that is the maker of vessels. Yes. For his kingdom. The one that makes us into tools in his hands. A vessel must be separated unto God and sanctified. The purpose of being separated and sanctified as a vessel. For God does not stymie or suppress that vessel. But it sets that vessel apart to be a tool. Yea, a vessel in God's hands. We are not called to fulfill human expectations. We are not called to satisfy the norms of human culture. We are called to be holy vessels that are separated 
and sanctified unto Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, I will ask you to bear with me as we begin again in 2 Timothy chapter 2. But we will begin at verse 15 this time. And allow me to expound upon these verses. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says study. That is to exert oneself to labor. Yes. To show thyself to substantiate and prove yourself. Approved unto God. This is the idea that metal coin currency was used and there was a certain weight that metal coin currency was supposed to have. And not all coins had the right weight. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. The reason that not all coins had the right weight was because there were some people that would take metal coins and shave them down right, right. so that they had the appearance of the coin, but they did not have the weight right. of the coin. Yeah, right. Come on. And so those weights that were correct, those coins that had the proper weight were referred to by people in the world as Dokimos, I think that's the way you pronounce it. Or Dokimos, however you say it. This word really represented in a practical way the way that the world viewed Christians. They said they're people of full weight. They're not shaved down. They're not having the appearance but lacking the full weight. Wait. They're not counterfeit. Come on. They're genuine. Right. They're authentic. Yes. They're real. Yes. Right. My God, could we be Dokimos yes. or Dokimos coins in our world? Yes. yes. Hallelujah. Approved of God. God says you got the full weight. Yeah. Come on. You haven't shaved it down. Right. Yeah. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. A toiler in the things of God that needeth not to be ashamed because you are not a counterfeiter who has removed part of the coin. Right. Rightly dividing the word of truth directly, correctly, and proceeding on a straight path of teaching the holy truth of God's word. Hallelujah. The concepts of God's word. The ideas that we find in the word of God. And then he says in verse 16. But shun. Stay away from. Separate yourself from. Profane and vain babblings. Which are the philosophical ideas of the heathen which are the ungodly and empty and fruitless discussions of useless matters and profitless speculations, which ultimately end in fatal doctrinal errors. For they, the profane and vain babblings, increase unto more ungodliness. And their words, their concepts, their ideas, their philosophy will eat as a canker, yeah. will eat away at you like gangrene, right. which corrupts and spreads and attacks and eats away and even eventually reaches the bone to right. destroy the bone. Right. Right. Yeah. And then he says, I'm going to give you two examples. A man named Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, they have missed the mark, uh -huh. saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow, they destabilize the power of, and ultimately destroy by undermining the authority of the faith yeah. of some. 
Nevertheless, the foundation of God, the principles and system of the truth of God standeth sure, cannot be undermined. Amen. Having this seal, having this authentication that the Lord knoweth them that are his. The Lord authenticates. The Lord verifies through his complete knowledge of us those that are truly his and that are not counterfeits. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor to a lower more common use like those that spend their time and their energy on profane and vain babblings that lead to fatal doctrinal errors if a man therefore purge himself from these, if a man avoids the defilement of profane and vain babblings of philosophy and fruitless speculation and discussions, he shall be a vessel. He shall be whatsoever thing that is needed. He will be a container. He will be an implement. He will be a utensil. He will be a tool for labor, for music, for war, for whatever purpose God wants fulfilled. Unto honor and sanctified, separated unto God. Meet easily used for the master's use, the absolute ruler's use, right. and prepared or made ready unto every good work, which is honorable labor. You see, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 44, verse 23, it describes one of the good works of God's vessels. It says, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane yes. and yes. cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. I want to turn our attention today to two very important altars that are spoken of in the word of God. If you will look with me in Exodus chapter 27, beginning in verse number one, we find out about this first altar that God spoke to Moses about. And he said in Exodus 27 verse one, thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. The altar was called the altar of burnt offering. It was called the brazen altar. It was called the table of the Lord. The word altar means the killing place. Right, right. And the fire on this altar, according to Leviticus 6 and 9, was never to be permitted to go out. Right. 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 Brass, which is also copper or bronze, can be hardened and tempered. And it can be used for weapons. And it can be used for cutting instruments. Because brass is harder than silver. It's harder than gold. Brass can withstand higher temperatures of fire than silver or gold. Brass was also associated with lust and with harlotry and filthiness. Yet when brass is purified and dedicated to the altar, 
where life is surrendered, right. the place of killing, right. brass becomes holy unto wow. the Lord. Wow. The second altar we find is recorded in Exodus chapter 30. And we begin in verse number one. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four squares shall be it, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. The top thereof and the sides thereof round about and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it that shalt thou make it and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall offer no strange incense thereon, no burnt sacrifice, no meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it uh, once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. This altar was called the altar of incense. It was also called the golden altar. On this altar, sweet spices were continually burned with fire taken from the brazen altar. The morning and the evening were commenced by the high priest offering of incense on this altar, burning with the incense that was a type of prayer. Gold is a metaphorical of the golden splendor of heaven. No metal has been more frequently mentioned in the Old Testament writing than gold. And none has more terms applied to it. Gold is called pure. It's called refined. It's called the finest. It's called beaten. It's called fine gold. And it's called treasure. The gold used in the tabernacle and the various Vessels and instruments of the tabernacle that were made out of gold were made of gold that was brought with the Jews when they made their exodus from Egypt. This gold was primarily in the form of jewelry, which God instructed Moses to tell the Jewish women to ask for from the Egyptian women as they were preparing to leave Egypt. Egypt is the same place that God saves you and I from. And the land of the former sin or the land of death, God wants to bring people out of. And can I tell you that God turns the gold of idolatry and the gold of worldliness, which was in the jewelry, into a golden altar used to symbolize prayer and worship of God. Why are these two altars so important? Because they represent the work of the ministry. They represent the work of the vessels of God. Turning with me in the book of Numbers, chapter 16. 
Please bear with me. We are going somewhere today. Numbers chapter number 16. We will begin in verse number 1. The Bible is talking to us about a situation that was not a good situation. And it was within the ministry. Numbers chapter 16 verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Hishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And there rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his yeah. and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do take you censors. Korah and all his company and put fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Le Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to him to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring him before the Lord. Every man his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves 
from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? And wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, and Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram. And the elders of Israel followed him, and he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that pertaineth unto them. And they go down quick into the pit. Then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods and they all that they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning and scatter thou the fire yonder for they are hallowed, the censers of these sinners against their own souls. Let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offered them before the Lord. Therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eliezer the priest took the brazen censers wherewith they that were burnt had offered. And they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel. That no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord. That he be not as Korah and his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. The problem moved from the ministry to the people. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord appeared and Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said to Aaron, One minister said to another minister, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly 
unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the plague was stayed. Aaron, who was the high priest that was chosen by God, used a censer, a vessel, with incense to make an atonement for the sinful congregation. That censer would have been the golden censer, the golden vessel used for the golden altar of incense, which represented prayer and worship unto God. But we must understand something, that the fire or the coals used on the golden altar of incense could only come from the fire or the coals of the brazen altar where the sacrifice for atonement of sins was made. He took the censer with fire in one hand from the place of sacrifice and he took incense in the other hand from the place of prayer and intercession until he reached the place between the dead and the living and once he arrived there he put the incense on the coals of the fire and that action represented his intercessory prayer for the people laid upon the coals of fire used to consume the sacrifices of sin and it caused the plague to stop this action linked the altar of sacrifice, the brazen altar, with the altar of prayer and worship, the golden altar. The coals of the fire from the brazen altar had first been touched by the drippings of the fat that came forth from the sacrifices made on the brazen altar. Then those coals of fire were taken to the golden altar and touched with the sweet-smelling incense. Thus the two altars were joined because what ascended from the brazen altar of sacrifice was not complete without that which ascended from the golden altar of prayer and worship. And that which ascended from the golden altar of prayer and worship was not complete without that which ascended from the brazen altar of sacrifice. 1 Chronicles 22 and 19 says, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. Holy vessels set apart Sacred vessels, separated vessels, containers, implements, utensils, tools for war, for music, for worship, for prayer, for labor. Why do you and I need to be encouraged and strengthened and refreshed and revived? Because we are called to stand between the dead and the living. We are called to bring people to an atonement place. Because you are a vessel that is a weapon of war for the kingdom of God. You are a vessel that is a tool of labor in the kingdom of God. You are a vessel that is a yoke of oxen for the kingdom of God. 
You are a vessel that is an instrument of worship and prayer. I'm going to say some things here that you may not have considered before. And I hope in Jesus' name that these illustrations help us today. Some people may say this is a beautiful vessel. I got it at Goodwill. <laughs> that is not made out of silver. It is not made out of gold or brass or copper. It is not made out of stone or clay. It is made out of glass. It may be beautiful to the eye, but it's very vulnerable to being broken, being made useless, being destroyed and crushed. You may not get real excited about this, but this is a vessel. This is like a fire pan that the Bible is talking about. There's copper here. Brass. There it is there. This is not vulnerable like that is. This doesn't break like that does. Amen. This may not be very appealing to the eye, but it's very necessary in the work. Come on. Right. Right. You may not find people lining up saying, oh, can I just touch your vessel? Somebody else may go, I'm going to go to the museum and look at that beautiful vessel. And I'm going to go to a gallery and I'm going to buy one of those vessels. And I'm going to take it home and touch it. I'm going to go over to it and admire it. Not many people put this in their china cabinet. <laughs> Lots of folks put that in china cabinets. God didn't call us to be items in a china cabinet. <laughs> He called us to be vessels that were not easily broken, that could contain fire, that could do the work of the ministry, that could take from the place of sacrifice the fire and go to the place of prayer and say, God, I'm bringing to you that which you are wanting from me. You are made of that which enables you to be a holy vessel unto the Lord. And the materials of your salvation and the materials of your calling are materials that Satan cannot compete with. Satan cannot compete with the holy vessels of God. Right. Right. Hallelujah. Because God's made you a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. You're empowered. You're enabled. You're anointed. And you have a purpose. There is not a worldly purpose. Hallelujah. Your vessel may not impress some people, but your vessel will impress God. yourself from these things that are vain and profane babblings that lead to fatal errors of doctrine. Oh, we, we, we want to go and we want to check out the books of so-and-so. We want to listen to the seminars of so-and-so. And they are not even saved people. They are not even saved people. They got a big congregation, but they ain't saved. Come on. Come on. They're like this right here. Come on. They're like that right there. I'm sorry. Beauty that appeals to the world is not going to be able to go to the brazen altar or the golden altar. 
And we should not try to take that kind of vessel and make it do this work. Yes. The vessel is a container. It's a tool designed for receiving and then distributing. Now you may not like this, but I'm going to tell you right now, you can feed a baby out of this. You can feed a baby milk out of this. You get what I'm saying? If you're careful, you can put milk up in here. And thank God you can put some steak up in here. Yeah. This vessel will feed a baby and it'll feed a full grown adult. Hallelujah. A vessel is intended to be filled and then emptied. A vessel is intended for holding and releasing. A vessel is intended for containing and expressing. A vessel is intended for preserving seed and then planting seed. A vessel may not impress some because a vessel can be used as a weapon of war. I'm telling you right now, you can knock somebody out with this. <laughs> you can take them out with this right here. You can't do it with that like you can with this. Because, hey, the Bible says put on the full armor of God, right? Hello. He didn't say put on, you know, the, the, the pretty stuff. Armor. Armor. It's made out of stuff that will resist, that will withstand, that, that will not be destroyed. So because this vessel can be a vessel of war, it can be used offensively to go after the enemy, and it can be used defensively to protect from the attacks of the enemy. In either case, the weapon, the vessel, is the point of contact with the enemy and the enemy's weapons. Yeah. If you're a vessel of God, you're the point of contact yeah. where the enemy clashes yeah. with the kingdom of God. Yeah. It is the point of contact and clashing this action of advancing against the enemy offensively and this action of protecting defensively against the enemy's attacks, this bringing of the vessel into direct collision, direct clashing, direct conflict, direct blows with the enemy which if we are honest can leave marred places on the vessel. It can leave gouges on the vessel, dents and scars on the vessel. But thank God, the vessel is made out of stuff that Satan can't break. Referring back to Brother Ari Prado, just taking that as a backdrop. When they bury you, and when they bury me, may it truthfully be said that we were willing vessels for the Lord in the battle, in labor, in praise, in worship. May it truthfully be said that we were containers of the word, of truth, of mercy and compassion, of conviction and determination, of righteousness and holiness. That we were not afraid to distribute it, not afraid of emptying it out, not afraid of releasing and expressing it, not afraid of preserving the seed, not afraid of planting the seed of the word of God. May it truthfully we understood the absolute sacrifice of being a vessel because we understood the absolute necessity of being a vessel for the Lord because the people needed atonement from the holy vessel. 
may it truthfully be said that we remained consecrated and we remained separated vessels. Yes. Even when somebody didn't understand the consecration and separation required for the vessel. May it truthfully be said that we were not arrogant and we were not egotistical, but that we were humble vessels that were willing to be shaped by the hand of the Lord every day in every circumstance. Yes. 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 When they bury you and when they bury me, may it be that others can recognize there were worn places. There were worn places in our lives because those places were heavily used for the Lord. Yes. May it be that others would come to realize the beauty and the honor and the privilege of being a willing vessel. The beauty and honor and privilege of being a willing utensil and instrument and implement and even a weapon of war. Spiritually speaking, some may run their fingers across the surface of our life as if someone were running their fingers across the surface of a tool that has been used for many years in all kinds of weather, in all kinds of challenges, in all kinds of circumstances, and they would come to a closer understanding of what the willingness and the consecration and the separation brought into the life of the vessel that was a willing vessel in the hand of the Lord. You are like the ark that God instructed Noah to build. It was a vessel. You are like the Ark of the Covenant that God instructed Moses to build, containing the testimony, the word of God. You are like the tabernacle. You are like the temple where God's presence dwells. You pray when no one else is praying because you're a vessel. You shout when no one else is shouting. You worship when no one else is worshiping. You praise when no one else is praising. You give thanks when no one else is giving thanks. You plant the seed when no one else is planting the seed. You believe when no one else believes. You trust when no one else trusts. You walk by faith when no one else is walking by faith. You lift up the name of Jesus when no one else is lifting up the name of Jesus. Because you're saved. You're anointed. And you're made out of stuff that Satan cannot break or crush or stop. Shepherd's rods and shepherd's stabs and slings and rocks are necessary at times. I just want to stop here for a moment. And I want to talk about the families of the ministry. If the hand that holds this is weakened because their family relationships are weakened, the work of the vessel is hindered. Yeah. Right. Yes. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Come on. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Work in voluntary cooperation with your husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, mothers, 
Love your children. The integrated, complex, and necessary design of the family does not go out the window when God calls you into the ministry. Because the work of the vessel needs to be accomplished with strength, Amen. with encouragement, Amen. with reviving. Yes. I will ask this question because I know that it happens. Do all children or all family members of ministers make it to heaven? No. Many times it's because of a misunderstanding of the work of the vessel. I will pose this question to the children. Would you rather be raised in the home of a holy vessel or a vessel of weak and wicked people? Oh, I think that the home of the weak wicked would be preferable to the home of the holy. My only reply to that would be, if you live long enough, you'll come to know there's a vast difference. There is a vast difference. And when you endeavor in the fear of God to raise your family in the will of God, in the word of God, in the fear of God, and they reach the age where they leave your home, you have done what God has required and expected of you. They must come to the point on their own of saying, I want God. I need God. You see, sometimes, please don't fault me for saying this, sometimes the church can become a harlot to a minister where he neglects his spouse. Sometimes the church can become the other woman. God does not expect for us to replace our wives with the ministry. He expects us to cultivate, care, and nurture our wives along with us in the ministry. God does not expect us to disregard the needs of our children simply because we are in the ministry. God expects us to cultivate and to care for our children and bring them along with us in the ministry. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. We allow our children to taste. We allow our children to see the strength of the Lord in their own lives because they see the strength of God in our lives. Your family is blessed when you're blessed. Your family is encouraged when you're encouraged. Your family is revived when you're revived. There are so many different things that can be said today about the purpose of the ministry. But I will repeat this. The highest privilege, the greatest honor, the most sacred purpose among mankind is to be called to be a vessel yeah. of ministry yeah. for the Lord Jesus. Yeah. If the singers would like to come, I'm going to invite us 
to consider the importance of being a vessel, a holy vessel for God that can handle the fire from the altar of sacrifice and handle the fire from that place to the altar of incense to where we don't get off track that we keep in the forefront of our mind the purpose that we are made as strong as we are is so that we can stand between the dead and the living in order to help them receive atonement did Moses and Aaron have good cause to say, God, wipe them out. Did Moses and Aaron have just cause to say, you're right, God, wipe them out. They did have just cause, but they fell on their face. And they interceded for those that did not respect them. They interceded for those that opposed them. They interceded for those that were doing everything they could to discredit them. To mock them. To minimize their influence. To say, you take too much on you. You want to be a prince over us. And Moses said, this didn't come from my mind. It came from the mind of God. Why don't we just come and stand before the Lord. And allow him to help us. To embrace the highest privilege, the greatest honor, and the most sacred purpose among mankind to be called a vessel, to be called to be a vessel of ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're made out of stuff that Satan cannot break, that Satan cannot crush, you're not made out of glass. You're not made out of glass. Hallelujah. You're not made out of the fragile. You're made out of that which is strong. Out of that which can handle the fire. God, would you anoint us right now with a deeper understanding of the purpose of the vessel that we have ever had before. In the name of Jesus Christ. 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 Name of Jesus Christ. Embrace the vessel. Embrace the purpose of the vessel.
Help us to honor the scars. Help us to honor the couches. Help us to honor the workplaces. Help us to honor, Lord God, the struggle and the strength and the labor. Help us, God, to honor, not to be ashamed, but to honor those things that, Lord, have affected us. When we work as a vessel, that is the point of contact where the enemy is encountered. Jesus, we pray right now, God. Hallelujah. Your power flow in us. Your revelation flow in us. Open our understanding that we might understand the scriptures. We want to be a full weight coin. We want to be a full weight coin. We don't want to shave off any of the metal of the coin so that we can be known as genuine and authentic. For the Lord knows who is His. The Lord knows who is His. The Lord knows who is His. If you need prayer for your body, with oil. You need prayer for your mind, for your emotions, or for your spirit. We're going to anoint you with oil. And afterwards, we're going to have the ministry. Pray for this prayer call in Jesus' name.
Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. You are our hope and our strength. You are our reason. now your holy hedge of protection upon each and every soul that has attended this conference. I pray, God, the anointing of the vessel upon each and every soul that has been a part of this conference and that will view it online in the name of Jesus Christ. Nazareth, Yeah, we'll say it's true. Now, come on, we have to. 